Thank you very much, Barb. Um, it is an absolute delight to be here today with uh, this like-minded people. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, as Libby did so eloquently, that we are here on the land of the traditional owners, the Wadawurrung people on this side of Pankalai and the Gabbardwood of the Eastern Maya Nation on the other side. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that on the authority, the Great Ocean Road Authority, we have Sarah Eccles, who is a traditional owner from the Wadawurrung, and Jason Mifsud, who is a traditional owner from Eastern Ma. I acknowledge traditional owners' long-term and continuous connection to our lands. I acknowledge our as past, present. And I acknowledge that the Great Ocean Road Authority is actually being set up under legislation to enable us to think about a new way of working with traditional owners. We, in fact, want to lead the conversation about our coastal public parks, marines and um, foreshore lands from an essence of 50,000 years of history. It's time that we actually acknowledge 50,000 years of civilization as we've known it through the stories that have been passed on through the connection to land. We've all been here for less than 100 years, probably. 50,000 years really deserves some significance in the work of the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. So I guess I'm setting for you uh, the scene of where the authority starts. So to be here today to talk a little bit about how the authority was born, um, give you a bit of a sense of, I guess, how it came about and what our, um, our mandate is, what our role is, what our function is. Some of the early thinking of the board, we've met uh, five times now since December 1, when we were uh, uh, stood up by legislation, by the first amount of the first tranche of legislation. So in fact, we're very early days, but in the early days, we were doing our forming phase, getting to know each other around the board, and a brand new organisation is sitting under us, which is very much, you know, wheels in motion, keeping things going while building, a bit like building the plane while flying. So I've come here as an Aries Inlet resident of over 20, 21 years now, and like Libby, my three children went to that school, hit up on that tennis wall, played around in the foreshore reserve, and became coastal kids. Um, just last year, we rented our house out in Bamber Road, opposite the valley, um, to a local family with three children like us, um, so that they could retain a presence in the coastal community. And we bought a farm at Penny Royal, actually. <laughs> so we have moved in the last 12 months to a hinterland town, and it's the hinterland behind Lawn. So I now do a very regular trip down to Lawn every two or three days for shopping, for yoga, for walks, um, and to just obviously enjoy and replenish myself through being in the coast. It's something that is really um, a part of who I am. It's a part of the the family that I've grown up with, my oldest 25 now, working for Parks Victoria on the strategic fire break. So I understand very much about some of the challenges there. But I've got a 23 year old and a 21 year old and a, and a wonderful husband. And so areas for us will always be our home and where we've grown our family and developed our values. And I think that we have something really special in areas. And it's come through the community survey, uh, which I, I was involved in back in, I don't know, 18 years ago, <laughs> a long time ago, um, before I got onto council, actually. And I wish I got onto council in 2004. And uh, it's something about tracking values over time that gives us a really clear sense of who we are. And even though areas has changed quite considerably, I'd have to say, in the time that uh, I've been here, um, and many of you have been here longer than me, I'm sure, um, it, it's something about what we all agree on that holds us together. And there are always pressures. Gosh, I went through the days of, do we need a footy over? Well and truly, my husband and I set up the first footy team for Aries, the Aries and the Eels, uh, with Frank Costa as our number one ticket holder, of course. Um, so there's always challenges around what is it that we want to be, who we want to be, how do we express ourselves? But having a really clear sense of values is just so important. It, it, it binds us together. And there's not many communities, quite honestly, along the coast that have done the work that we have done in areas to outline over many years what matters most to us. 
as a community and what are the values that bind us together. And you listen to hearing about Barb going through the VCAT applications, understanding the frameworks and the planning scheme, understanding when it actually doesn't meet the community values, knowing the neighbourhood character work that we did a long time ago that expressed what we wanted to see um, in the built form in areas. It's so important. Engaging in process when process is there to engage in. It's so important. And to me, that's what an informed, active, proactive community does. And the benefits of coming from a values-led approach and knowing how to engage and influence. So I congratulate Ada. I congratulate Charlotte in her term as president and Barb before that, and all of the Ada committee. Um, I always have enjoyed listening and engaging with the committee at various times. And I said to Barbara Leslie, just as I walked in the door, um, I actually wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Barb, because back in about, I don't know, 2002 maybe, maybe, Barb set up a little group, Local Women for Local Government. And a few of us sat around in Barb's land room, had cups of tea, maybe something stronger, no, cups of tea I think it was, <laughs> and talked about how important it is to have women on local council. And actually, a few years later, I was elected a councillor and stayed as uh, eight years on council. But we've had many great women on the Surf Coast Shire, and I acknowledge Libby Stapleton as another one of those great women who put a hand up after actually a lot of encouragement over many years. But um, doing the work, I guess, that many of us need to think about how do we do it? And acknowledge Lecky or the first female mayor, I think, in, in Victoria. So we've got many, many people in this community who understand how to influence and um, be, I guess, having a seat at the table when it matters to help make a decision. So it is an incredible privilege to have been um, uh, asked, I guess, to be the inaugural chair of the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of that after waffling, waffling on for a little bit about, about me, but, but just about us as a community and the importance. So, you can see that there. I'm going to put my glasses on. Just so I'm <laughs> um, it's been a few years in um, the journey for getting here, and it came about because of the frustrations, I guess you could say, in terms of um, complexity, complexity on the coast. How do we actually, how do we actually ensure that what we all love most? particularly the environmental values. How, how can we manage the pressures that are coming to bear, whether that's climate change and the impact on the public land and public realm, whether that's population growth and the desire of people to live by the sea, as we've seen, um, you know, in Torquay in particular, has certainly um, been a receptacle of our passion to live by the coast. And so the, the other part of that is the tourism and how do we actually enable people to visit and enjoy this beautiful part of the world but to add value in a conscious way to this environment and to learn from the environment. So this action plan slide gives you a bit of an idea. We started talking about the, the management arrangements. We had a task force which Peter Batchelor and Terry Mulder chaired. They had a whole lot of discussions and community consultations and, and, and came up with a view that was essentially um, how we could do this was simplifying the governance arrangements. So the government has announced an action plan and in fact has passed the first legislation, the first bill, which is just the first part of establishing the Great Ocean Road Authority. The first bill really established the entity and brought together two coastal committees the Great Ocean Road Coast Committee and the, Law, uh, the Ocean Otway Coast Committee, which goes um, from Wye River down, set down to um, Marengo. So that's the first bit. So we're, we're still not quite fully formed yet. We're just four or five months in and we're really two coastal committees coming together. I should say, as I'm chatting, if anyone's got any questions, please um, put your hand up or interact. I'm very comfortable to to, to you know, have a dialogue as we go. So we're here, in fact, as a new entity and really for a few things. It's about 
the complexity and the fragmentation of management arrangements that exist currently. And it's about making sure that we actually improve the way we do manage the public realm. So a single entity considering the length of the Great Ocean Road was seen as a step forward. A step forward in considering a, a connected system with Torquay to Warrnambool. And that, in fact, decisions that are made across that interconnected system have impacts and we need to understand that. And so the whole notion of the Greater Australian Coast and Parks Authority is to help improve those management arrangements and view this environment as an interconnected system. The role is very much about intergenerational benefits, looking forward. We know that we have quite significant um, impacts on climate change and on the coastal infrastructure that sits in the foreshore area and on the beaches, on the intertidal areas. We are facing loss of much of the coastal area, the coastal foreshore reserves over time, over the next 50 years. So we need to have a long-term view about how we plan for that. And there are parts of the Grey Ocean Road environment that are more vulnerable than others, um, but we've seen uh, quite significant impacts. Demons Bluff, for example, really quite significant impacts there with rock falls and instability. These are things that happen because the coast is a dynamic environment and we, you know, there's not really a fix to things. You can manage them, but you can't stop the rocks from falling or the sea from coming in or the storm surges from impacting our dune system. But how we manage that is very important and how we build community knowledge around the management is also really important. So that's part of why we're here. The other part is also the marine environment. We've not had a marine management plan for other than the two uh, marine national parks, which we're privileged to have in our region. But the areas outside the marine national, national parks do need a management plan. So part of our work is to work with state government and the Victorian Marine and Coastal Council to understand how we might improve the marine management <coughs> in, the marine, in, the, in the waters. So just to give you a bit of an idea in a diagram, it's really about the one integrated living entity when we think about the Great Ocean Road. And the, the policy objectives are sitting there for you, particularly around the ecological and landscape integrity, very you know, fundamentally critical. The acknowledgement that traditional owners are not represented at all within our coastal environment. Very, very rarely do we see any interpretation of time before European history. We've got such an opportunity to think differently about how we work with our traditional owners. And we've got such an opportunity at this point in time in Victoria, as the government is leading a real agenda on self-determination and treaty. We're actually leading the country around our vision for engagement and acknowledgement and co-management of traditional owners. And so our legislation has been written with that as an expectation. Again, protecting the distinctive area and landscapes, and we know there's quite a bit of work going on around acknowledging and identifying those areas. We have the opportunity to think carefully about what the visitation economy looks like. And I, I actually haven't spoken to anyone in a community along the length of the road down to Warrnambool, but including Port Port Campbell, Hollow Bay, certainly Lawn areas, Anglesey and Torquay, that has seen great benefit in the type of tourism that we had pre-COVID. That type of tourism which sees a one day wonder is seriously not adding any value, particularly even for the people who are zooming down the road on the bus. That experience is underwhelming and it leads to overcrowding in key destinations doesn't necessarily lead to any great impact from a, a visitor economy perspective either. And we've seen uh, in Apollo Bay, talking to businesses there, that they've been able to adjust. Certainly there's less money coming in to the fewer businesses who benefited, but many businesses have been able to adjust <coughs> and are reorientating how they view their opportunities to engage with the more domestic markets. So part of the role of the authority is to think very carefully around 
the conscious traveller, that's the language we're using, the conscious visitor, even conscious communities. What is it that we want to highlight and shine a light on and engage with visitors around this truly special place in the world? So there is an opportunity for that, um, and that is something part of, uh, obviously, the policy objectives and the critical thinking that's happening in very early days. And, oh yes, ma'am, how do you define the word grow in that context? Mm. Because the, the worry is... Yeah, it, it's not numbers, it's that's how we don't define it. It's yield, really. So, in fact, we would like to see less people staying longer, slowing down, exploring the hinterland, considering um, what truly is on offer as opposed to trying to get to the one thing that's, you know, down there. Yeah. So experiencing the journey of the road and the environment in a way that enables, I guess, a more deliberate experience, that enables people to understand what they will be seeing when they go. So maybe growing in a number of ways, growing in an understanding and an appreciation of the area and the region that they're coming into and growing certainly the opportunity for people to stay longer and probably spend more. It's, it's not growing the numbers. I notice around the world, and, and I think Suzanne is really into this area as well, which is fantastic. Um, I notice a lot of tourism destinations are thinking deeply about what it means. I notice that New Zealand have already said they want to shrink their footprint of tourism. So there's lots of words we can use, sustainable tourism, or, um, regenerative tourism, but truly what does it mean? What do we experience? What is the experience for host communities and what is the experience for the, for the traveller, for the tourist? I see that Venice has put the sign up saying no cruise ships anymore into Venice. Now they're brave, important decisions that will change a direction. And um, I, I guess for me as chair of with the authority, the conversations we're starting to have around the board table are very much around that. It's not going to be an overnight decision, although there's a few, a few things I do that would change things overnight. <laughs> Might not put them on record yet, <laughs> but I know there's some things we could do right now that would change the experience, <coughs> particularly in this community around buses. So um, I guess this is a work in progress, but certainly a role, role of the authority. <laughs> Just, um, I'll flick through, because I'm feeling like I'm talking a long time, but the, the Act has asked, has, has done a number of things and asked us to do a number of things. So the first part of the Act, the first part of the legislation, established the authority. It's providing um, the principles, the protection principles, which will guide how we work. It provides for us a direction around an obligation to engage with local communities when developing public land management plans and policies. So how do we engage deeply? And how do we not replicate the great work that happens in council or the great work that happens through community groups around values and aspirations? How might we understand how to partner around understanding and learning about what is already known? We don't want more consultation. We don't want more tick box stuff. We actually want to take things further than where we currently are. And our communities across the Great Ocean Road have had a lot of engagement um, through multiple channels. So hopefully the role of the authority can do better around coordinating that. I've talked about traditional owner rights, so their aspirations for land, water and culture are realised, and I would put that as one of the top priorities for the board. And one of the other things we're being asked to do over time is report on the environment um, the conditions of our coasts and our parks so that we can track over time has the authority and the management arrangements and the deliberate approach around engagement with communities and traditional owners and our approach around sustainable tourism. Is that making a difference? Are we having an impact as we should? So we should be measuring that. So these are very, uh, very you know, early days, we're not into any of this work, but this is the direction of the first tranche of legislation. To give you a sense, the um, Coast and Parks Authority has kind of three main areas that we do. So we're really public land managers. So that's the foreshore, the beaches, <coughs> parks, the coastal parks and marine water, national parks in certain areas, the trails, the tracks, the viewing platforms, local ports, 
in, um, particularly in Apollo Bay. We're also one, going to be one of the largest uh, provider of accommodation, tourism accommodation, through our caravan parks. And that's a really fantastic thing because that is accessible, affordable accommodation in actually the most beautiful locations on the coast that is, have those caravan parks and um, camping grounds are. And so, again, enabling all Victorians and people from interstate and internationally eventually, but all Victorians who own the coast, this is public land, it's owned by all Victorians, to experience um, through staying at the accommodation facilities that the authority runs. It's also a really important part of our funding model because the revenue generated through the caravan parks is revenue that comes back into supporting a sustainable organisation. So there's a little bit of way to go on that. We've got quite a bit of investment to bring up the assets in our caravan parks. Uh, but over time, we would hope that the experiences um, and the investment in the assets in the caravan parks keeps the caravan parks busy all year round and continues to bring in the revenue required. The other role is the coordination role. And I'll just give you an example of what that means. Coordination is really important when managing public land. And recently at Demons Bluff, if you've seen any of the social media, we've had um, pretty significant landfall. It's quite, it comes up on your emergency app actually, that there is landfall there. We're asking people to stay away. Recently, the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority <coughs> Management Team met with DELP, met with Parks, so three key agencies, and wanted to discuss the management arrangement for this. And we understood that each agency had done their own mapping, their own surveying, their own kind of analysis as the opportunity, and none had talked to each other. So the lack of coordination around this, uh, around the Great Ocean Road and its environment has been part of the problem. And so now the authority has this role around a coordinated general function. So be the lead agency to coordinate um, the works, the exploration, the management responses on our public land. So it's already, you know, starting in a minor way at an operational sense. You can see that that's our Great Ocean Road area. You can see the dotted line. And if I do that, that gives you a bit of a sense. Oh, that's, the, that's the region and the area, the land management um, that is going to progressively over time be transferred to um, the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. At the moment, we're, we're at Apollo Bay, so we're right back here. We're less than a halfway through in terms of receiving the land into our remit. By the time we have full responsibility, there will be around 30 different agencies who will have handed over uh, their responsibility to the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. I can see a question. Yes. Yeah. So, so some of the first two areas now managed by Parks Victoria. That's right. So uh, that's going to be some part of Yes, so for example, good, good example, of the bluff. So the question was that some of the coastal land, in fact, Parks Victoria is one of, is the largest land manager of public land across the Victorian coast. And so down this way, there is as well. There will be, that land will be transferred to the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. And it's very likely we will work in a contract way with Parks Victoria to support on land management where they have expertise. Particularly, um, we won't be taking any of the broad acre national park in areas, but where there's a logic around where national park, uh, parks stick are, managing coastal portion reserves and there's logic that it becomes under the authority, we absolutely will. But acknowledging that you know there is significant expertise and an important partnership there with Park Stick. Um, yeah, so good good question. So that gives you a bit of a sense of the, the region. Is there any other questions? Anyone got anything they'd like to raise just as we're going through? Yes Mary Jane. The oh there's the hinterland groups. So um, thank you actually because that reminds me. So, what you can see is at the top of that map, the Princess Highway and the Princess Freeway, and you can see the green, which is the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks. One of the key pieces in the legislation that the government have committed to is what's called a strategic planning framework. So, very important for us to understand that. And that is an opportunity to do strategic planning across that whole region, across the Surf Coast, Colac, Otway, Karangamite, and Moyne, to align 
uh, planning schemes to enable us to have the protections that we need to have and for the management of the coast, but also to consider the role the hinterland plays. It's really important for the viability of the coast and the vitality of the coast that we also look to supporting and growing our hinterland communities. And now living in a hinterland community and uh, heading to the forest often, because it's a beautiful community, vibrant growing village, Dean's Marsh, Hiragara, they're all offering their own uniqueness that add to the richness, I think, of the Great Ocean Road region. And so this strategic planning framework will cover this whole region and those routes are ways that are, I guess, showing the opportunities to connect um, communities within the hinterland to the coast. They provide alternate um, mechanisms for leaving the coast, which is also very important. Um, yeah, so that, that's a good question. Thank you, Mary Jane. It's, that's, the, that's the region for you to see. That piece of strategic framework strategic planning and the framework that will come from it is being led through the Department of Waterland and Planning, Dell, uh, but the planning outcomes will be then brought into the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. It's a really important space to keep watch on and engage with uh, because it, it does, um, we do have the opportunities, coastal communities, to be part of that as do the hinterland communities. So I'm just going to pop up um, an aspiration here, something that I'm working with. It's already reached out to me. One of the things that I'm very interested in doing in the authority is helping our communities understand uh, their role and place in the settlement. So Aries has a particular function and role as a small village type low key settlement, quite different to Lawn, which is a much, much bigger, diverse community that comes in, that spends time with <coughs> nearly 20,000 people over the summer or over the peak periods will enjoy lawn in all of its um, tourism accommodation. So it has a different role and function to areas. As does Apollo Bay, as does Port Campbell, as does Port Petty and Anderson. But one of the things we need to develop is a framework and, and a set of aspirations that is bigger than just our communities. And that is actually a connecting piece. So I'm so excited that the um, board have agreed to work with the Monash Institute of Sustainable Development and John Waits, you may know John Waits, former Minister for uh, Environment, uh, I think that was his last role. He is leading, he's chair actually of the Monash Institute for Sustainable Development and their role is to consider and embed the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into, into Victoria and into, um, I guess, organisations, government, places where we can elevate and connect uh, the work that we do into a bigger global vision. So the Sustainable Development Goals, we're working, uh, we're kicking off our work in May to think about how the principles and values that underpin the Sustainable Development Goals can be brought into the principles and vision of the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority and the operations of our work as well. So it's a bit of a watch this space, but I guess it helps you see our aspirations that this is about connecting our communities through something overarching, a set of values that are globally recognised, that are important when we think about the sustainable development of our world. And I you know, hope one day we might be at the United Nations talking about this for our Great Ocean Road region. It is a really significant part of Australia and part of the world, and we should be um, considering how we elevate what we do on the world stage and show best practice around that. Yes. Sorry, if you make just a comment. Yes. Chris, uh, Chris Hutton is speaking. Hello, Chris. Just uh, looking at a report on the sustainability goals across the Western world. Uh, huge challenge for us here because basically we've failed across most of the indicators. Yes. Yes, there are some real challenges around national leadership in certain areas. And so, waiting for that. <laughs> You know, probably is not a good thing, so why not us as, a, as an entity which has significant remit for a large area, over 240 kilometres of area, why not think about what we can do to build it in? And as an organisation that's just got its training wheels on and it's just, you know, beginning to build itself, if we build in the way that we want to work, the way we want to evaluate our work, the decision-making criteria for the choices we make on the coast, through the lens of the Sustainable Development Goals, 
I think we are talking a language which is transferable <coughs> and which is really important, quite honestly, when we think about our role as public land managers and the intergenerational accountability we have for people who aren't here yet. 50 years time, 100 years time, we are doing our work now for people who are not here yet. So I'll move on from that, but I'm a little bit excited about that one. So just some, a little bit of detail now, just about some of the projects we're doing. Um, we are doing some work around engagement because it is critical that we get that right. But as I said, it is not standalone, sit out there, tick box stuff. It needs to be engaging with critical partners like the Surf Coast Shire or Polak or Oshire with our community groups as well. We've just started our corporate planning work, which is um, a key document as a statutory authority that we need to deliver. It's the very beginning of our strategic work, so it's really the first steps of having conversations. But I will share with you a couple of the statements that came from our session this week that might help you just get a feel for the, the values that are around the table. So we started talking about our vision. We haven't got a vision yet. We're really trying to understand that. But the question was, when we've been successful, dot, 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 so when we've been successful, and there's a few responses that will help build our vision eventually, but when we've been successful, we will have a vibrant, growing and sustainable tourism industry that attracts Victorian, interstate and international visitors who spend their money in the region, supported by protecting and sustaining natural resources. So I started with that one, I don't quite know why, but just that one's there. Uh, we've been successful when the Great Ocean Road is managed as one living entity that enables the region to be well-resourced and thriving communities and visitor experiences focused on cultural and environmental values. When we've been successful, we will see the voice of traditional owners. They will be apparent in our decisions and reflected on the ground. When we've been successful, we will see Indigenous and other cultural heritage values that inform land management practice. So working in partnership with traditional owners in how they manage land, learning from traditional owners' practices on land management. We've been successful when we will see, feel and experience our Aboriginal heritage and history, know what it is, value it and respect it. We'll be successful when we have the right balance between environmental protection, conservation, and tourism management and enjoyment. So there's a, there's a range of statements that have been coming out of the work that we've done this, just this week to start informing our vision. So we're very early days on getting that work happening, but there's a strong commitment around the table to um, transformation. This is not just what it was. We are putting a line in the sand and saying that the future will look different and the land management practices will be informed from a different base. Um, we've recently recruited our CEO, which is exciting, and Jody Sizer is our inaugural CEO for the Great Ocean Road Coast and Parks Authority. She will commence in June, and we look forward to an amazing woman taking the helm and beginning the leadership of this authority. She's an incredible visionary, she's dynamic, she's smart, very skilled in working in complex, dynamic situations, and she's an Indigenous woman who has set up the um, PwC Indigenous Consulting Arm and has worked across Australia in Indigenous communities. She lives in Torquay for 17 years, has seen the impact of <coughs> growth and development in her neighbourhood. So that's a really exciting um, announcement and one that uh, I guess sets us on the path around the leadership for the organisation. We've certainly been the benefit of getting some quite a bit of um, income coming in, which is um, that's all around supporting and redeveloping infrastructure that's required. It's only recently been announced, so the plan for how that rolls out is still being developed. But it is good to see the government spending a bit of time um, investing in uh, the Great Ocean Road and the infrastructure that has been um, has been needing investment. We also look like we've got our head office sorted out, which is fantastic. There was a commitment from the government that the head office would be in Torquay, so that's been done. 